Joining us now to speak more about the case is legal expert Dr. Tracy A. Pearson. Dr. Pearson, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you, and thank you for having me. It's great to be here. So there were a lot of charges here. Can you break them down a little for us? What's the difference between malice murder charge and the two felony murder charges? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Malice murder is uh, what you would consider your traditional uh, murder charge. It's the deliberate intent to unlawfully take the life of another human being um, where there's no considerable provocation. And when the person who is engaging in the act, the defendant shows an abandonment uh, and malignant heart, um, meaning essentially that, that, that they don't care or they've lost um, all sort of empathy for another human being. Uh, felony murder, however, is a, a unique charge in the law. And it's unique because it doesn't require you to actually pull the trigger of a gun. Um, if you're in engaging in the commission of a felony and it results in the murder of a human being, you can be found guilty of felony murder without ever having uh, attempted to uh, kill the human being with uh, a deadly weapon. Um, So that's the difference there. Uh, As far as as breaking down the charges and and the uh, verdicts, um, there were three defendants in this case, all white. Um, All were charged with felony murder. Two were related. Uh, We have uh, Travis McMichael and and Greg McMichael, Greg McMichael being the father of Travis. Um, And again, uh, as your introduction uh, discussed, a gentleman by the name of of William Roddy Bryan, um, who was also charged with uh, false imprisonment. Um, They were all charged with multiple counts of multiple crimes. So malice murder, felony murder, Um, aggravated uh, assault. Aggravated assault is when uh, you are either intending to engage in, in in this situation, murder, or uh, when you're engaging uh, with a deadly weapon or with any object like a vehicle uh, with the intent to um, commit a serious bodily injury. Um, And so for the most part, um, we're looking at a verdict where um, William, uh, William Roddy Bryant uh, was, uh, I'll work backwards, um, was not guilty of malice murder. Um, he was guilty of three of the four counts of felony murder, one of the two counts of aggravated assault. He was guilty of false imprisonment. False imprisonment is a unique charge in the sense that as long as you are preventing another human being from leaving from where they are. So imagine if, if you're standing in your dorm room and somebody is standing in the doorway and they're blocking your egress from that dorm room and you can't get out, technically they're falsely imprisoning you. Um, so in, in this situation, uh, they charge false imprisonment and as well as attempt to commit a felony, uh, which is sort of an add-on that you usually see. Um, as for the, the other defendants, um, the father wasn't guilty of malice murder, but he was guilty of um, all of the other charges. So of uh, felony murder, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and attempt to commit a felony. Um, and Travis Mc- McMichael was charged with malice murder, was convicted of malice murder, as well as all the other charges. So what are your thoughts on how the prosecution handled themselves throughout the case? You know, I got to tell you, I, I thought that they were professional, despite the race baiting. Um, they stayed focused on the goal, which was to prosecute these people for the crimes. Um, you know, at the very beginning of this, the, the jury selection uh, could have been a distraction for the prosecution, but they appeared to focus on proving their case. Um, even though the county was about 26 percent black, there was only one black man selected. Uh, the jury was made up of three white men, 12 white women, um, and one black man. And the defense had struck 11 out of 12 black jurors, which frankly is unconscionable. Um, In the cross-examinations of these defendants, what you saw was the prosecution was methodical in the way that they picked apart their stories. Um, The son admitted that he didn't call the police before he chased down Mr. Arbery. He knew that no crime had been committed, even though he was engaged in that behavior. Uh, He didn't see any weapon, which would uh, prevent someone from making a self-defense argument. 
And um, he also told investigators that they had, and I, I hate using this terminology because it's, you know, but this is what he testified to, uh, that, that he had Mr. Arbery trapped like a rat. Um, and so what we saw was a prosecution that was prepared, that had, the, had good facts, had, had evidence, and was uh, very focused on what their job was, which was to prosecute these defendants for the crimes that they had been charged. And a focal point of this case was the video. The murder was caught on that video, and it spread throughout social media like wildfire. So how did that video, combined with the social media presence, contribute to the outcome of the verdict? Sure. Uh, the jurors decided this case based on the evidence. That's what a jury is supposed to do, and, and I contend that's what they did. Um, but the prosecution of the case happened because of that video. Originally, the local district attorney wouldn't prosecute the case and, in fact, hindered local law enforcement by ordering them not to arrest the son, Travis McMichael. Um, then the state of Georgia became involved because of that widespread attention uh, caused by social media and that video. And not only was the case prosecuted successfully now, but that uh, the former local district attorney who barred uh, law enforcement from uh, doing their job and who refused to charge the case, um, she has been charged for violating her oath of office and a misdemeanor of obstruction of a police officer. So um, it, it, the, the video and the social media atten attention this, this case received was very helpful in these circumstances. Um, so going back to social media, what do you think the impact of having courtrooms um, and the cameras in the courtroom was for this trial? Because everyone on social media was able to see it. Um, it was publicly broadcast. Do you think that had an effect on public opinion? Well, you know, public opinion is 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 all well and good. I, there, there's only the only pe people's opinions we really care about, to be honest with you, are the people who are sitting in the jury box. Um, but the country had an opportunity to see how blatantly racist a defense attorney could be in Georgia. Um, I have to tell you, as a, as a trial lawyer, a former trial lawyer, somebody who, who did uh, a lot of different kinds of work, including criminal defense, I was aghast at some of the things that came out of that gentleman's mouth and gentlemen being used very loosely. Um, you know, all of the ruckus around having black pastors at the trial and and, and what not just was unconscionable in my mind. Um, you know, the ABA, the American Bar Association, adopted a model rule that prohibited lawyers from engaging in, in behavior uh, or conduct um, that's discriminatory and harassing but, and it's conduct that's related to the practice of law. So the fact that that, that, that happened just to me blew my mind every time I saw it. Uh, and it was played a lot. Um, but I, I think that you know, when it came to the having cameras in the courtroom in this situation, I, I don't know that it had any impact on the case as much as it had an impact on what we came to understand about how these trials are prosecuted in various areas of the country. Dr. Pearson, thank you so much for all the time today.